So this is chapter 51, and this is one of my favorite chapters in the book because I love animal behavior. Um, so the technical term for studying animal behavior is ethology, and so that's what this chapter is going to be about. So it's going to get into how a behavior happens and why it's going to happen, what evolutionary advantage does it have, and that type of thing. Um, so in this picture that you see here, this is showing two birds that are doing a mating ritual, and they do it in the early spring. So if we look at this behavior, they're going to mate, that happens in early spring, that means they're going to have their offspring in the summer. Okay, so that's the kind of backstory about this behavior. Now let's go into what's called the ultimate and proximate causation. So proximate causation is going to get into how that actually works, and ultimate causation is going to talk about why that behavior happens. So let's get into the how. So I mentioned that it happens every spring. So what kind of clues would they have from nature to let them know that spring is starting to happen? Well, if you think about it, there's probably longer days. Um, there's probably warmer temperatures. So those types of things might actually give them clues that spring is coming upon them. Now, as for the ultimate causation about why they would have that mating ritual in the early spring, well, if you think about it, summer would be the best time to have offspring because it's the mildest temperature to bring them into. And also, there's probably a lot more food around at that time. So evolutionarily, it's advantageous for them to do that so they can pass their genes on to the next generation. So that's the difference between ultimate and proximate causation. So hopefully you can see that difference. Um, so then the next thing we're going to talk about are different types of behaviors. And um, the first one we're going to get into is one that occurs... Um, let's see if I can get this to go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, one that occurs... Um, due to different stimuli. So this one right here is going to be the next one in your notes that's called fixed action patterns. So what this picture is showing is the male stickleback fish. And the male stickleback fish has that red belly that you can see up here in this picture. And so what's going to happen is the males are very territorial. They don't want their mates um, mating with anybody else. And so if another male comes into the territory, you can see sort of in this picture how this guy's kind of blowing up, and they will actually fight to the death. So um, the red belly was something that scientists decided that they wanted to study. And so what they did is they put pictures that look like all of these along the side of the fish tank. And what they found was even if, they gave the exact replica of a male stickleback fish. It just didn't have the red belly. The male didn't care. But if they put all these shapes in front of here with the red on it, the male would go crazy and bang against the glass. And what's awesome is they actually um, thought of this because there was a girl working in their lab who wore a red shirt one day, and the male was, like, going up against the glass, like, must kill her. Um, and then there was also, um, you know, red cars going by the window, and the, and the male would freak. So that's kind of what started the study. So the red belly in this example is going to be what's called a sign stimulus, and that's going to be what's actually kind of making them do that behavior. So that's going to be a fixed action pattern. Now the thing about a fixed action pattern is it's going to be something that has to, they're going to do it, and then if they get interrupted, they're going to not care and complete that entire behavior. Um, another example of this would be I used to have an Alaskan Malamute named Ella. And every night, Ella, when she would go get on her bed, she would do three circles, and then she would lay down. And I was like, what is that? And it was so funny because if you interrupted her, she would have to start her three circles over again. But she always would do it. And I found out later that's like an old evolutionary trait of like matting down grass where they would be laying. But kind of interesting, right? So that's a fixed action pattern as well. Now, the next group that we're going to get into is going to have to do with um, oriented movements. So something that's going to make an organism move from one place to another. So this first one here, kinesis, um, is an interesting one. And kinesis is just an increase in activity rate um, due to some sort of change in the environment. But it's not really going in one specific direction. So great, great example for this is the so bug that you see here. And so what happens is the so bugs have to have humidity in order to survive. And so if it gets dry, what's going to happen is that will trigger a kinesis behavior in them. And you can see its, it's trail. It's just kind of going all over the place. So it's going. It has no idea where it's going. But 
the basis behind this behavior is that if he starts moving around and going in whatever direction, he has a greater chance of finding a humid spot than just staying still. So the organism doesn't know where that humid spot is, but by increasing its turning rate and its activity, then it might actually have a chance of finding a humid spot. And you can see here, it did find a little spot under a leaf, so it was successful. So that's going to be um, kinesis. Now the next one, <clears throat> taxis, has to do with oriented movement with a specific direction in mind. So this picture here is of some trout, and you can see that um, they are all facing upstream, right? So they are facing a specific direction, upstream. So the reason they would do that is, well, there's a couple of them, right? They can see their prey coming. They have less of a chance of getting swept away by the current. Um, they can also see predators coming. So um, taxis is going to be directly towards something or directly away from it. So, you know, last summer when I was hiking, we were going along and all of a sudden we heard gunshots because it was hunting season. So we went away from the gunshots, right? That's taxis. We went exactly away from it. If you're cooking something and it smells really good and um, everybody starts coming into the kitchen, that's taxis, right? Because they're coming towards that smell. So that's going to be an oriented um, movement example. Now, another one is going to be migration. So migration, if we're going to define it, it's just going to be a long distance change um, or a long distance movement that's usually pretty regular, like you do it every year or something like that. So birds are famous for doing this. Whales are also famous for doing this, right? So you're going for a very long distance and it's kind of a regular process that happens like once a year or certain seasons. Um, so a cool thing about migration is a lot of people ask, well, how do these things know where they're going? I mean, how does a whale know what direction north or south is. Um, so there's a couple of mechanisms that different organisms use that's pretty interesting. Um, a lot of things that live in the ocean actually use the moon and the stars to help them to migrate. And um, there are some birds that actually have a built-in compass in their brain. So um, pigeons are notorious for having a really, really good sense of the magnetic field, and that's how they know what direction they're going. So um, pigeons are actually really, really good at that. So kind of interesting, all these different cues that we use from the environment to figure this stuff out. Um, the next one is going to be um, behavioral rhythms, and um, <clears throat> those are going to be things that are usually based on either an annual or a 24-hour clock. So the fact that like when you wake up in the morning, um, you wake up usually because it's starting to get light out, or the fact that when it gets dark out, you start to feel tired, that's what's called a circadian rhythm, and that's based on um, a 24-hour cycle. You can also have what's called circannual rhythms, and those are going to be based on a yearly type of cycle. So that's like when something goes in heat once a year or something like that, or migrating. Um, so circadian rhythms, there's a lot of research going into that because super cool stuff. Um, in fish farming, what they're doing is they have these indoor fish farms and they've got the lights to simulate the sunlight. And what they're doing is actually shortening the day that they expose the fish to so that within a regular 24-hour period, the fish think it's been two days and they've gotten them to grow a lot faster. So cool stuff and they're doing this with plants too. So circadian rhythms are really, really interesting and that's just kind of ingrained in us and that's why it's so difficult if you've ever had a graveyard shift to switch over to that cycle because we're so used to it. Okay. Um, then the next little part here, animal signals and communication, um, this is also a pretty fun little section because this has to do with how animals communicate with one another. So we have a lot of ways of communicating with one another. Um, certain organisms, as far as we know, use specific ways, but very, very interesting ways that they can um, communicate with one, each other, with one another. So um, one thing we got to make sure that we can tell the difference between is a signal and communication. So if I wave to you, that's a signal, um, but it's not communication until you've accepted that signal and actually processed it and hopefully even wave back, right? So um, that's the difference. So signaling is kind of one direction. Communication is both directions. So that's how you can think of the difference between them. So a couple of types of communication that we can have. Whoops. Okay. 
So you can have a visual signal. So me waving at you, that was a visual signal. Um, this little guy here, Fiddler Crab, um, that's also a visual signal. These guys are hilarious. What they do is they actually have that big claw. These are the males. And they wave it at the females like, hey, check me out. I've got a good gene pool. And I hate to say this, but um, size does matter with these guys. And so the bigger the claw waving in the air, the more females are going to come over to them. And then they basically take them into their little... Um, house down here and they mate. So that's a visual signal though because they're actually waving their claw at them like that. Um, another type of signaling is going to be chemical communication and that's going to happen through the use of pheromones. So pheromones are chemicals that we emit that we can actually use to communicate. Insects, especially bees that you see here, perfect example for that because they are super, super um, in tune with their pheromones. Now, we actually emit pheromones too, although we tend to not think about that as much when we think about the way we communicate. And it's really interesting because now they're making like perfumes and colognes with like pheromones that are like, I want to mate kind of pheromones. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, but pheromones are really, really cool. They've done studies on them in humans. Um, some of them that are really neat is that um, women tend to emit dim different pheromones when they're ovulating versus when they're not. And so they, they did a study where they had um, the same woman and um, exposed men to her um, all throughout a month. And the men found her way more attractive when she was ovulating. So they actually sensed some types of pheromones that were being released. So pheromones can be used for I want to mate kind of stuff, but it can also be used as a warning. So here's a cool study that your book talks about where minnows actually do release an alarm pheromone if there's a predator in the area. So what these scientists did is they actually wanted to prove that. So they got that pheromone um, and injected it into the water and all the minnows like got as far away from it as they could because they knew that something bad was there. So super cool pheromone idea. Okay. Next one is tactile, and tactile has to do with touching. So if you look at all these pictures, you can see these animals are all touching each other. And that's a really important type of communication because um, that can be used for all sorts of different things, um, sensing fear, um, you know, comforting. Like if you think about it, we do tactile where we put our arm around someone if they're upset or something. So tactile communication has to do with touch. And then the last type of communication is going to be auditory communication. So what I'm doing right now, right, by talking is a good example. What my awful dogs are doing out there, barking, that's auditory, and birds as well. And we're actually going to do a really cool um, study on some birds. Um, you're actually going to be working on the data from it. And what they're finding is birds are changing their songs that live in urban areas because it's so loud that they have to be able to be heard. And so what they're finding is ones that live in urban areas um, can't communicate with ones from the same species in suburban or rural areas. Um, and that's all because of noise pollution. So super interesting when you get into all of these different fields. And so like I said, we'll get into that in class when we do that activity.